The following is a production of the University of Minnesota. Uh, for day, today's lecture, we have with us Mr. Pratap Mysore. He works with HDR Engineering and he has an experience of working in the field of power system protection with the utility for over 35 years. And I had the opportunity of taking power system protection under him last semester. And it was a lot of you were in that course with me. And it was a great course. And I really enjoyed it. So it's over to you, sir. I'm just going to pass around the stuff. Thank you, Mudita. Good afternoon. Uh, before I start the lecture, I wanted to see what was your background. How many of your civil engineers? Wonderful. And mechanical? Electrical? That's good. So this is uh, watered down quite a lot. So you have to tell me those who are not electrical engineers to see whether it makes sense or it doesn't make sense. I have been uh, in this field for over 35 years. So everything looks uh, obvious and then simple to me. But uh, you are the ones who will uh, look at it and then uh, review and think. <clears throat> okay. So what we will cover is uh, what kind of an electrical network is required when you are installing or uh, connecting a wind power uh, plant, uh, wind generator to the electrical network uh, to make use of the power so you can distribute it to the load. And then, uh, you know, there are some norms and rules and regulations either stipulated by the state or by the industry standards as to say what should be your operating range, you know, if you say your voltage. If you go and then plug in something in your uh, outlet, you have to make sure that it is 120 volts. It's not 200 volts coming out of it. It will uh, damage everything, right? So there are standards uh, which stipulates that what should be the normal range and uh, what is acceptable as uh, some short term over voltages. And then, uh, you know, if it is too much, what you need to do. And then we'll look at the electrical uh, parameters of the system. And then we'll come back and look at it. Suppose if we exceed or go out of these normal ranges, what actions do we need to take to uh, bring it back to the, either the normal range, that is the control a actions, which you study in electrical uh, uh, systems. You, you study a lot of uh, controls where you want to bring it back to the normal. And the other one is if it is really out of uh, whack, and if there is a short circuit or if there is a problem, then you want to take it out of service. That is what the protective relays do. And then uh, we will look at only those protection schemes that are used pertaining to only wind generators and also the system that is connected to the wind generators. Then we will introduce some terms which are used in power system protection, uh, selectivity, sensitivity, and, and reliability and, uh, you know, zones of protection. One thing you need to know, if the system is working normally, nobody cares about protection system and power engineers. Only if something doesn't work, they say, it is because of you, we tripped it. Just like, uh, you know, blackout in 2003, they say, oh, the relays were not set right, that's why you tripped. So that is how uh, protection engineers are known as. So they are always thinking about abnormal sequences or situations to give, uh, uh, you know, find out and then bring the system back to normal and how to control it. As I mentioned here, we will look at uh, wind generation, uh, what is typically used. These will be the packages which are produced, supplied along with the wind manufacturers. Sometimes you can go and look at it. And those of you who are not in electrical area, you know that if somebody talks about metering and relaying diagrams or electrical networks, you will get a glimpse of what do they mean. And uh, that is my intent, that you get some clarifications. I have taken a simple electrical uh, network here. Uh, here I have uh, wind generators, and then uh, you typically connect them to a, a distribution feeder, which is up to 34.5 kV or 34,500 volts. 
when we mention normal voltage of these systems, they are always, it is a three phase system and it is a voltage between two phases that is 34.5. If they say it is a 115,000, 115 kV, it is a phase to phase voltage they are talking about, not phase to ground. Uh, the relationship between that is if the, measure the voltage from one individual wire to the ground, phase to ground, what you get is 1 over, it is 57 percent of the phase to phase voltage or 1 over square root of 3 of the phase to phase voltage. So these, uh, there are, uh, yeah, these are winds uh, generators individually, they generate around how much, 575 to 600 volts, probably you are all much more familiar than me because a lot of people have given lectures. And uh, what they do is after that they, uh, they step it up, they convert the voltage and step up the voltage to 34.5, sometimes it could be 13.8 or uh, typically up to 34.5. I have heard that there are machines which are connected to 69,000 volts, but uh, I have not uh, come across that. I believe they are available. And then uh, they can generate uh, 1 megawatt. 1 megawatt if you take it is 1000 kilowatt, uh, that means you can set you can uh, supply energy for about 1000 homes or uh, 100 homes, so 10 kilowatt is typical for our house, 100 amps is a connection. So you get about 100 homes, you can uh, uh, supply power. So it, uh, the range is, it used to be normally about uh, 500 uh, kilowatt was the size of these machines and then now they have gone up to 2.6 and I can show you there is one on, on the um, see, uh, you know, it is not off land ones, they are up to 6 uh, megawatts, I think that is the biggest one I have seen. Essentially the bigger the size, the higher, more gen for, gen for more generation, what you need is a much bigger uh, diameter of the, uh, uh, of the, of the blades, uh, you know, total amount. Uh, I do not know whether anybody went into the energy conversion in this class or did anybody talk about it, how? Uh, how they are connected, converted, okay. Bit constant, did they talk about it or? Bit, yeah, bit constant, yeah. <laughs> 0.46 is. So 46 percent of the kinetic energy is converted to electrical energy out of that, that is what it means. So what uh, we do is we connect it to a, the 34.5 uh, system that is called a collector system or a feeder in uh, typical utility terms and then they bring it back to a substation. Uh, it is an electrical enclosure in a fence where you have uh, uh, you know, individuals, once a group of uh, machines are brought together, they are called wind farms and then wind farm collector sub will be here where you collect it from different wind farms. So individually you have three or four uh, groups of uh, wind farms. They bring them together and then what they do is they step it up to the transmission level voltage this could be 69 to 345 kV, 69,000 to 345,000. Essentially wherever there is a transmission line and you have wind, they just go and hook it up, uh, that is what happens. So it, uh, it can, uh, you know, you have a step up transformer and then you connect it to the grid. So this is a general uh, simple one line diagram they call it, they do not show all the three phases, they just show uh, topographically how they are connected. Now, when we say uh, this is, uh, system is designed to operate at a certain voltage, then uh, they have some standards. I just mentioned those standards for those in electrical, they want to see, you know, what could be the tolerance that is allowable on this. Then they have got American National Standards uh, ANSI 84-1, which uh, they define what should be the normal operating range of voltage up to 230,000 volts. Then there is one more standard IEEE 1312, it, they go for up to UHV kV, that is about 1100 kV. Uh, the systems what we have in uh, United States is only up to 765, and, but they have been written, uh, you know, there are other systems up to 1100 kV. So voltage classifications. Uh, it is little different than what you hear from the wind uh, manufacturers sometimes, they say it is an HV system, HV system for them is anything more than that is connected 34.5 and uh, you know 13.5 wherever they are connecting it. 
in as Paranci and others, we define low voltages, voltages up to 1000 volts and the medium voltage is uh, up to 100 kV and then uh, uh, you know high voltage is 100 kV to 200 uh, uh, kV uh, and then extra high voltage is 345 to 765 kV. Ultra high voltage also is there 1100 kV which is not in the uh, United States. As we define, uh, it's within 5% of the specified nominal voltage should be our normal operating range. Suppose if you say, if you plug in a computer here, if say 120 volts supply, it has to be between 114 and then 126. So then uh, if it is outside the range, you have to take a corrective action, utility or whatever, whoever who is supplying you the power have to take corrective action to bring it back. Uh, to this voltage to within this operating range. So they define two ranges, uh, range A which is a normal operating range and then the range B they call them as uh, under contingencies or under emergency conditions you can go up to 10 percent. Uh, these are defined in the ANSI C84. So maximum range for range A is 5% of the nominal. So you cannot exceed 126 volts here. Similarly, 34.5 kV cannot go more than 36.2 kV. 69, they go up to 72.5. 115 kV, 121. 345, 362, they have defined like this. And then the minim minimum, it is typically about 2.5% less than the nominal or it can go up to 5% depending on the voltages. Uh, so if 13.8, they say it's 97.5, it has to be 13.46 to, uh, you know, 14 point, uh, uh, you know, 49, right? Uh, 14 kV, 14.2, uh, I think is 5% of that. That's what uh, is defined. Similarly, say it's 14.49, here it is 34.5, 36.2 kV to 33.63 kV. And then they also have defined, suppose if somebody wants to say put up a plant and uh, they, a utility says that they're going to come and connect something and they're going to supply power, you have to guarantee 90% of the nominal voltage at that particular connection point. The reason for that is the motors uh, will not start if it is less than 85%. So typically, yeah, the uh, utilities guarantee 90% uh, voltage at that particular point. But within the utility itself, it is not within the normal range. Momentarily, it can go to that value. You need to bring it back to that uh, nominal, uh, you know, its nominal voltage as soon as possible. If you go to the lower voltages, then uh, state gets in. If it is 115 kV or uh, even distribution levels, uh, uh, state does not get into much of these regulations. But if you go to the distribution and then the house and other things, then some states also stipulate and say what should be your uh, voltage range and how much of you know uh, uh, harmonics it can have, and they define those. <coughs> now we looked at the voltage. The other factor which comes into picture is the current that is going through a conductor or uh, you know if there is a transformer you are pushing power. Power is nothing but voltage times the current. That is why when you generate uh, at a lower voltage, if you want to get the same amount of power outside, you multiply, uh, you know, if you step it up to a higher voltage, then you have lesser current coming out of the conductor. A good example is if you have 100 megawatts at uh, uh, 34.5 kV, then it is about uh, 1600 amps of current coming in. So if you go to 345, it comes to 160 amperes. So you need a thinner wire and you can transport more power if you have the same conductor size at 345 at higher power. So typically a generator, even though it is generating at a lower voltage, you try to step it up so that it can send more power from the generation side to the low side. The disadvantage of these uh, power uh, wind uh, machines is that you are putting wind machines in an area where there is no uh, population or nothing. They are typically far away from the system and then you want to bring it back to the load center. Here uh, we have in southern Minnesota, most of the power, we have about 1000 megawatts of wind there. 
everything comes to the Twin Cities. So we bring it through 345 and 115 PV lines from south of uh, Minnesota to here. So you look at the conductor and then you have uh, yeah, you know, overhead uh, wires or you put underground cables and they have ratings depending on the temperature rise. So the, what they do is if essentially if you pass more current, it has got some resistance, it gets heated. So you limit the temperature to some value. If you take the cables, then uh, they are at 90 degrees or 105 degrees, they specify. That is how you can buy. And then if you have a, a conductor, there are different types of conductors, copper conductor. Nobody uses copper because uh, it will not be there next day. Somebody else will steal it. So they go for aluminum conductors, all aluminum. And aluminum conductors doesn't have the enough, enough strength if you string. Then what they do is they put a steel core on that. So it is aluminum conductor, uh, aluminum conductor steel reinforced is another one. And then they have, uh, uh, right now the biggest one is uh, ceramic by 3M, where you can go up to 300 degrees uh, centigrade. Nothing happens to that because of this, uh, it's supported by the ceramic wire. So if you heat it more, what it means you can push more current on the same wire from point A to point B. So essentially, depending on the cable or uh, the type of conductor what you are using, you are uh, limited by the amount of current you are pushing from point A to point B. That means the amount of power you transfer from one point to another point. So what we monitor, we monitor the temperature. We cannot measure the temperature at different points of the conductor. So what we look at it is we look at the current. If it exceeds some value, we know that it is exceeding the temperature. We take corrective action. So what we measure is the voltage is the first one to make sure that your system is operating within normal conditions. If it is outside the normal conditions, you try to have some controls on the wind generators. We try to modulate and then uh, you know, regulate the voltage. And if you can't do that, then you have to use uh, uh, protection schemes that take it out of service if, it is, if there is an abnormality. Similarly, transformers are also nothing but windings. And then you have got wind, one winding on the low side and then winding on the high side. The relationship between that is the voltage ratio is proportional to the number of turns you put in the transformer. So if you are going from 34.5 to 345, the ratio of number of turns on the primary 345K to the secondary side is 10, uh, 10 to 1. So you use that, but there also you look at uh, monitoring the temperature through the current going through that. The, uh, luckily, transformers are huge devices. You can embed uh, 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 thermostats and then you can uh, get the temperature or you can have a coil and then looking at the current, you can simulate and find out what would be the uh, current through the windings that can be done. Other thing they do on the transformers is if you want to load the transformer more, that means if you want to push power through that, higher power through that, you forcibly cool it by putting cooling fans on the sides of the transformer. So they have a base rating and then they put two stages of fans and then you can get 67% more of the, if it's 100 MVA, uh, then you can get about 167 MVA by putting two stages of uh, um, fans on that. So we looked at the voltage, we looked at uh, the current, and then the other uh, parameter which we also want to regulate or keep within normal uh, thing is frequency. Typically frequencies are pretty uh, uh, standard, but you know, it uh, varies uh, it, uh, if what is the frequency a machine is running and then producing at 60 hertz, which is essentially if it is a two pole, it is running at 3600 RPM and generating electricity. Then the, if, the, it, if it has enough load, if load and then the generator, total amount of generation is equal to amount of load consumed, they are balanced and they work very well. So suddenly, if you go back and then trip certain lines, trip means you just dis, uh, disconnect a lot of load. If there is a sudden change in load, uh, the governors of the machines take certain amount of time. So there is more generation than the load. So there is an imbalance. The machines tend to speed up. And then uh, you, they take corrective actions and then they reduce the steam input or uh, whatever. Uh, here it is the wind. Uh, you can just change the uh, 
uh, blade uh, pitch and then you control so that you uh, try to regulate this power. Uh, that is one uh, method that is used. Similarly, if you are so much, so many generation and then you have the load, then you trip the generators off or trip the lines which are supplying power, then there is too much of load that pulls the whole system down. So that is what happened in 2003 blackout when Cleveland, uh, they lost a lot of lines for, which was supplying to Cleveland and the whole power took a turn and then went via New York to Cleveland and then took the whole system down. So there are regional requirements to constantly monitor the frequency. Frequency is a very good indication that you, how your system is operating also. If your frequency is trying to go up, then uh, or the voltage is going up, then also you know that uh, it's slightly loaded and then you have to take corrective actions. Uh, so they monitor voltage, they monitor the frequency, and also they monitor the current. So C. R. Mason was one of the general electric engineers who got sick of people who were asking questions about protection because there were no protection books at that time in 1940s. So finally, he wrote a book called Art of Protection. It's a very simple, it's available in Google. It, it just goes through basic concepts. And he has designed many of these protective schemes. And then he says, a normal operation assumes no failures no mistakes of personnel nor acts of God. So this has a perfect system that uh, nothing is going to happen. There is no such thing like that. If there is a lightning and that hits a, 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 temperature, a, a, a tower which is, which is the tallest, then the amount of current that comes through the lightning bolt is 30,000 to 100,000 amps. It is going through some uh, resistance and the voltage goes up uh, pretty high. So what you do is you have to limit it and they use what are called surge resistors to clip that voltage to levels which does not, uh, which uh, do not do any other damage to other equipment connected. So when we design the system, we have to make sure that we look into the failures. And then another common thing is if a technician is working in a substation, he is supposed, there are a lot of panels. He was uh, supposed to go to say, uh, you know, 4 PE, they say, 4 P3 or so, uh, you know, one, their designation I'm just using, or 4 North uh, uh, 3 or so. And then they go, he, instead of that, going to that particular panel, he goes to the next panel and then opens a breaker. By mistake, he trips something else, then he realizes that. Uh, so those are very common errors. Uh, and then uh, abnormal operating situations. If a tornado goes through that or if there are straight winds, sometimes it takes a couple of transmission lines out of service. So suddenly there is no outlet for power. So one area is deficient of generation and then uh, you have voltage uh, problems or frequency problems in that area. So these are uh, pretty common. So what you have to do is you have to realize that the system is not normal, take corrective actions and then take it out of service. So what we concentrate today is only for electrical failures uh, which uh, and also by monitoring current voltage or frequency. But uh, what are the electrical failures? Insulation failures due to lightning is very common or whenever you switch a transmission line, a 345 kV line, the voltage can go up to 1000 kV momentarily because it acts as a capacitance for those of you who know in electrical terms when you try, suddenly try to energize a capacitor. Uh, there are transients and the transient voltage can be two times or three times their nominal voltage. So you will have uh, four voltages. What it does is it puts a stress on the insulation and then there might be a flashover. Uh, for example, if it is a dirty insulator and then it flashes over if the voltage reaches that level. So for that, uh, uh, what they do is they try to put surge arresters. They are just like clippers. They just chop the voltage at two per unit or two times per unit means uh, you know two times the nominal voltage and then uh, they make sure that such failures do not occur under normal switch conditions. But we do not uh, talk about it in this course on surge protection. We look at currents, monitoring currents, voltage or frequency. So that is where we have got uh, relays that uh, monitor these. The short circuit what happens when you take uh, uh, a voltage then connected to ground, 
it has a lower impedance path, so there is no limitation of the current. It produces high currents. For example, uh, I talked to you about 1600 amps is a total load for 100 megawatt at 34.5. If there is a fault, that can go up to 30, 40,000 amps. The system also supports it. So suddenly, a wire which was carrying about 1600 amps, it sees 10 times to 20 times its nominal current. So the temperature goes up. So you need to have something to isolate it so that it doesn't get damaged. And relays are the ones which operate. And then what they do is when they operate, they isolate all these faulted sections. And then they isolate only one portion. I, when I showed you the electrical network, which has the transformer and three feeders with all the wind generation, one relay operation for a fault in one generator, you don't want to trip the whole thing. So the idea here is that you want to trip only those which have some problem and then isolate and allow the rest of the system to operate normally. We already covered some of these. Uh, abnormal operating conditions is typically due to unbalance of generation and load. What it leads to is there will be a frequency deviation because they are not balanced. Either the machines are slowing down or speeding up because of an unbalance, or uh, uh, there, are too, there is too much current which is drawn from a system from these uh, uh, generators also. That is similar, as good as it is a higher load. And then whenever you have voltage going through that, it's just like your metrodome. You have got uh, air pressure to hold that. And if you try to get, put more and more power on that, the system just collapses. You need some reactive power, they call it, to hold it back. So because of deficiency of the reactive power, the system voltage also goes down. Uh, because they are, the generators cannot uh, put that reactive power, which is supposed to support the voltage in the system. So the definition of a protective relay is that it detects short circuits or abnormal operating conditions, and then uh, it isolates only the faulty equipment. Uh, what it means is whenever a relay is used, there should be an isolating device that could be a switch or an MCB, or even your MCBs in your house, they have overcurrent devices. When there's a short circuit, it just disconnects that particular uh, circuit. So similarly, there are, there, these are huge devices which have got an interrupting capability. As I mentioned, that fault current can be 40,000 amps. So it opens out and then isolates without creating any problems. These small switches and all uh, cannot handle the high currents. Now let's look at the protection requirements. I said that it isolates faulty equipment as soon as possible. So now, if we create a fault on the generator, what is it that we need to open? We have to open this breaker. That is what. So the relays detect that there was an abnormal condition, and it just opens out and then just isolates only the faulted uh, generator out of that. So this is our first basic step in protection schemes. What we do is we look at the topography of the system. And then we go back and say, say, what needs to be protected here? So I have an ability to isolate these sections. So you put breakers or circuit breakers, as they call, at different places, which has a capability of isolating uh, these devices. And then you put relays, which detect abnormal conditions of frequency, voltage, or overcurrent, and then just open the breaker. Now, what happens if that relay does not operate? So you need to have a secondary relay, right? So what we do is we put one protection. All the engineers always look for faulty conditions all the time. They always think that uh, you know the first contingency is not there. That is, suppose if the relay doesn't work, I have to put the second one. They put a second set of relaying to detect the same thing and then put the uh, uh, operate that breaker. Otherwise, you have to provide some other means. It cannot be local. You can sit from somewhere else and say, oh, there was a fault on the generator. It is taking too long a time, so I should take off the whole system. So it's called a backup system. But when you are using a backup system, it, you take more systems out of service. So typically, redundant systems are put locally 
so that if one of them, uh, they think that it is not working, the other one at least comes back and then tries to open the breaker. So if the breaker fails to operate, make sure that some other relay covers the fault we said, you go back and open this. So when you see that you took, there were so many other generators connected on the line, you lose the whole uh, system for all, all the feeder completely under such conditions. So it is important for people who are designing the protection schemes to make sure that they take away only small chunks of that so that they can allow the generation of other machines connected to the system. Then you also have not only AC alternating current sources, you use battery sources also in the system because yeah, the, the energy required to open a breaker or close the breaker, you typically use DC battery schemes. They, they are typically 125 volts. You will have regular lead acid batteries and then you connect 56 of them in series and then uh, you use that power to open, uh, the, you know, hit a solenoid which pulls a trigger which opens that whole mechanical device in the breakers. So you put either trip coil 1 and trip coil 2, you have redundancy there also. Suppose one coil fails, you hit, you hit the primary with, uh, you know, trip coil 1 is hit with them from the primary relay and then uh, trip coil 2 is uh, hit with a redundant relay. If suppose both of them say you put a breaker failure relay to detect that this did not operate and send a signal to the other end or there is a remote end breaker which is detecting that and then opening. So if the key system, a key thing here is if everything might be okay but your battery fails then you have a problem. So sometimes they put battery monitoring devices also to make sure that there is no open circuit in those. And then uh, they also whenever they are putting redundancy in the designs, you have to make sure that one common failure doesn't take it out. The only common thing is a battery and rest of the schemes, they wire it separately with individual fuses so that only that particular circuit uh, gets, uh, gets taken out uh, during uh, controls. <coughs> so typically relay inputs are, uh, you know, it's, it's got a current input and a voltage input. These are the only two we can measure and then we, uh, yeah, then the nominal current input for the rating of this relay is 5 amperes continuous, but it can take 100 amps momentarily if there is a short circuit. But when I talk to you about 100 megawatts of uh, power at 34.5 kV, the current was 1600 amps. So I have to have a means of uh, bringing that current from 1600 amps to 5 amperes for the relay. So what I use is called current transformers. They monitor the current flow on the line and then they step it down the current, step down the current to 5 amperes with a ratio. Suppose it is a 1600 to 5, then if I have 1600 amps flowing in, then I get about 5 amps. If it is 160 amps going on that, I get 0 0.5 amps on the secondary side that is connected to the relay. And then we, uh, this is all on this, okay. They have potential transformers also. I said it is 34.5 kV as a system. So I want to monitor the voltage and make sure that that is within the range. Then what I do, I put a, a transformer to step down the voltage from 34.5 to by square root of 3, it's 19.9 .9 kV face to ground. It is connected from face to ground and then get about 120 volts here. That is your standard relay input. So under normal conditions, if you have a CT, as I called as current transformer and a PT connected to the relay, if there is no current in the, in the CT, the current input is zero to the uh, relay. But if the voltage, if it is an energized system, it has a nominal voltage of 34.5 kV, which is 19.9 .9 phase to ground, we'll have 120 volts in each phase, phase A, phase B, and phase C, that is monitored to the relay. So when I said that you have 5% tolerance, then you know that it has to be between 126 and 114 volts. And uh, sometimes it is not 115, it will be, it can be 115 volts as nominal secondary, or sometimes it is 66 volts, because the older electromechanical relays they had, they could not handle more than about 70 volts, phase to, uh, you know, individual phases, so they were all 66. But the modern microprocessor based relays can take up to 300 volts. So you can use a standard 120 volt uh, uh, input into that. 
So you set the relay so that to alarm if it is more than uh, 126 volts or if it is less than uh, you know 114 volts then uh, you know if it is going too wider 120 percent of that if it is go to 144 volts then you say that I want to trip it after certain time. So that is how the basic concept of uh, relaying is done. What it does? It opens up the breaker and disconnects, de-energizes the whole system. So current operated relay, if I take, it has got either, you have three phases, A phase, B phase and C phase in this country. Uh, so they have, uh, you know, they have three phase system. So you need the current monitors for each phase. Uh, you can either use a single phase or you can use a three phase uh, to monitor the current and then you set the relay so that if the current exceeds some value then you trip that. As I mentioned to you 100 megawatts I am taking this example again and again it is 1600 amps is our full load current. So you have a cable which is rated for an overhead conductor which is rated for 2000 amps. So if it is an overhead conductor if it goes to 3000 amps nothing happens to that in a short time it has got a it is a thermal characteristic is there you have to heat that cable to certain value so you can put if it reaches 3000 amps then uh, you know 2000 amps if it is more than 2000 you give an alarm to the operator to say that hey you are exceeding this capability but you don't trip it at that time if it reaches 3000 amps then you wait for about 15 minutes or so and then you trip it out because you, are, you know that you, are, you will be exceeding its maximum operating temperature. And then uh, there are different times also associated with this that is the reason why I said you do not trip it right away. If it is a short circuit you suddenly sees 40,000 amps then you know that there was a fault there, there is a sudden uh, short from face to ground. So you want to trip it out as soon as possible, there is no intentional time delay. So 40,000 amps you get converted to the secondary side by the ratio of the CT and you set that relay uh, to that say for example 2005 if I use a CT 40,000 amps uh, is 100, uh, 100 amps right yeah 100 amps I will be there you are setting on the relay the trip instantaneously. And then uh, otherwise you can wait for some time, sometimes say it is a 5000 amps, uh, this is a current, then you wait for certain amount of time and then you call it a definite time. And sometimes you give an inverse characteristic just like heating curves, uh, so that if the current is more, your operating time reduces. If the current is uh, just above the load, then above its nominal rating, then you have more time before it take, uh, trips. So what we have is an input. Uh, for the relay which has got a current or the voltage these are the two inputs and in the current relay you monitor the current and you set a magnitude if it exceeds that value then you give a you isolate or isolate the generator or whatever uh, system you are having that you just uh, de-energize that. So for that you have three options you have got an instantaneous over current relay if the fault current is too high or very high set, uh, high current is flowing through, you try to take it off fast without any time delay. You know that it is a short circuit or you have some definite time, there might be a momentary overload. So you use certain time delays and these are also required so that if there is a fault somewhere else in the system, this might be feeding extra current because there is a short circuit. So you want to wait till something else operates and open that, so you use definite time. And then you also have another coordination capability that is called the inverse time. So these are the terms which we normally use. It is a definite time over current relay, inverse time over current relay, or it is an instantaneous over current relay. Voltage relays, uh, the relay input is same thing as single phase or three phase. It monitors the voltage. And then you set an over voltage relay and an under voltage relay. There are some undercurrent relays which are used in huge generators on the field uh, winding. They put that if the field open circuits then you see that there is a current uh, in that in the wind generations it is not there uh, because you are connected to the system and the rotor is the one which is rotating from the wind and you do not have any exciter extra, extra DC is uh, batteries are not used for that. Uh, no field windings are there in this. So in the case of uh, 
uh, you know, in big generators like uh, steam generators or hydro generators, you have field which has got a DC, then they use undercurrent relays on that. Uh, in the case of under voltage, you know that if the system voltage is too low, you are overloading, uh, your torque also reduces on the mesh, on the motors. So you might be burning out uh, the motor also, or you might get into stall conditions. So you don't want to allow the, those conditions. So you trip it off. The voltage is unacceptable for any of these. Similarly, you have instantaneous over voltage. Uh, time delayed uh, over voltage, definite time over voltage or inverse time over, over voltage, these are three. It is just the practice of uh, different countries, they use all these types. Uh, then we have uh, frequency relays. Now the voltage, what we measure for the two inputs are voltage and current. Voltage itself we use and it is a sinusoidal waveform, it is positive alternately becoming positive and negative and then uh, you look at the zero crossing when it turns from positive to negative and measure the time, that is how you know the frequency of the system. Um, so you, you measure that and then they have over frequency relays and under frequency relays and same instantaneous definite and inverse, these the uh, characteristics are the same. So. Essentially, most of the relays which are used in the wind machines are uh, the over current relays for detecting short circuits or you have uh, voltage relays. If there is too much voltage, you might damage the machine. So you try to use that for over voltage and under voltage. And then also you want to maintain the right frequency, you use frequency relays. So these are uh, typical uh, uh, protection schemes. Normally you take 5 minutes or 10 minutes break. So we will just go through a few of these uh, and then I want you to ask questions. If you do not understand also you can tell me that you, I have no clue what the heck you are talking about. <laughs> then I can go back and try to see whether I can make, uh, it can make sense to you. So what uh, they do is uh, as a relay engineer now you know the system, it is a single line uh, diagram as I showed you in the beginning. Then you determine what are the protection schemes you need, whether you need over current voltage or current uh, devices. Then you try to represent them on, uh, on schematics. Uh, you might have heard when they build uh, systems and all, they will have uh, three line schematics or uh, they will have a single line which shows uh, the topography and also where are the PTs and CTs uh, connected. And then if you try to Put all these relays in one particular, uh, you know, uh, the, the sheet. Then these are all, uh, you know, definite time over current relay, inverse time over current relay. You can't put this uh, uh, such a long description. So IEEE, that is Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, and ANSI, American National Standards, or IEC, if you are buying it from Europe, International Electrotechnical Commission, they have standards on for device numbers. They call it. So. Yeah, we have talked about overcurrent relay. So instantaneous overcurrent relay, they put it, uh, put a small uh, circle and then put 50 number on the device when what is connected to the CT in the single uh, line diagram. And then uh, you know if it is 51 time overcurrent relay, they shift, show that as time over it could be definite or inverse. Under voltage is 27, over voltage is 59 and 81 is the frequency. Even though you are not familiar with that, if you go back and look at a station diagram or something like that, they put these numbers, then you know what devices they have used and uh, you know, um, for, to protect these uh, conditions. So relay representation uh, is done like this, it's a simple diagram. I took only one generator and then one feeder connection here and then here. So you have a PT here, voltage which is uh, stepping down from 34.5 or is 19.9 kV phase to ground to 120 volts that is connected to the relay. And then you have a current input, I use 2005 because it was 1600 for 100 megawatt uh, connection. And then you uh, connect it here and then you devise, you put a device number 50 slash 51. That means you are using instantaneous as well as time uh, current. And you are using uh, 27 and 59 under voltage and over voltage. 
and then you have an under frequency and over frequency, 81U or 81U. This is a very typical thing. Then they show the contact output. Uh, there is a auxiliary relay inside uh, like a telephone relay which picks up and closes a contact which gives the uh, DC to the circuit breaker uh, trip coil uh, to energize and then uh, the trip coil gets energized and then it pulls a lever which opens the breaker. Uh, typically, most of the breakers are spring charge mechanisms. It is it's, uh, you know, charged with a spring and then it is held and then you pull a lever and then it discharges and that opens uh, with a, a full force. You get two to three cycles. A 60 cycle is 60 hertz. So one uh, 20th of one thirtieth of that uh, it operates. So what this is in a, in a metering in a relay diagram or relay connection representation, you just go back and show that whenever this relay output contact picks up, you trip this particular breaker. So this is a very common representation of a, of a relay scheme. So what we looked at was that you try to use relays which monitor the voltage, current, and frequency. And then if you are outside your operating range, normal operating range or specified current ratings or voltage ratings, then you take corrective action. And uh, you know if uh, you alarm first, and then either your operator takes corrective actions, or if it is a short circuit condition, there is no operator. Uh, uh, you know, operator cannot take that corrective action. Then you isolate that, and then tell what uh, it trip. If uh, you don't ask many questions, I was not sure whether it's only electrical or uh, rest of the combination too. So you have to. Talk in terms of that so that most of you understand what I was talking. And so I might be repeating quite a lot for those who have already taken my course or are associated with my previous course on protection, which we cover in detail. Uh, this gives an overview. That's why I, that thought, uh, I just thought that you can go through this. Now uh, we have uh, a system which we started with. And then uh, we now introduce a term called zones of protection. What it means is if uh, there is a protection which is uh, protecting the generator, then what we need to do is it just trips only that particular uh, breaker and isolates only the generator. So this is a zone of protection for the generator protection relay, uh, which detects uh, any abnormal condition that is just related to the generator and then trip it out. Now the next one, if you look at it, you have a feeder protection, which is in this area. You just monitor the current here and see if the current uh, on this is within its limit or not. If the current exceeds that, then you detect that this is not a good condition and then open this particular breaker. So now suppose if the fault is here, and then this also picks up for a short circuit. There also is a relay which picks up for the short circuit and the generator protection. So you just want to make sure that you wait for this breaker to open or, relay, or these relays to react to an abnormal situation and isolate this generator without tripping this breaker. So we will talk about it. This is called relay coordination. You have to make sure that if all of them see the fault, they don't want to say, oh, I have a fault, and then they don't want to trip out the whole system. So you have to wait and then allow the zones of protection to take care of their conditions. So if I define a generator protection as a zone here, for any fault within this, that particular zone, the generator protection relays are the first responders. They just detect that and then isolate the breaker. If they fail, then I have a backup protection, which is here. It says, oh, something happened there. It, nothing happened, so somebody didn't go. or show up there. So I trip that out and then take the feeder out. Now, what are the other ones which we can protect? We have, if there is any fault on this particular collector bus, which is just a junction of all the three um, uh, feeders with the wind generators that is going up to the system, then what I do is I just open these four breakers if there is a fault here. What does it do to this? Nothing. They, get, they just trip off and then all the generators just die down. But uh, you, you know, you won't have when the restoration is only with these uh, breakers, you close and then take it back into the system. 
The other advantage of using these zones of protection is if you are working and then uh, you want to know where the fault is in a system, then you know exactly, you can pinpoint and say that, oh, there was a fault on this particular generator, generator number 15. And then this is because of the overcurrent. So most of these relays will have a target uh, or an indication which says that what operated and what tripped the breaker. So when uh, they go there and then uh, most of these relays will indicate what initiated the tripping and you will see that. And the great advantage of the microprocessor based relays now is that it has a capability of recording the voltage and the current, whatever inputs that is given, and then what operated and what other elements also saw this uh, uh, kind of an abnormality and what finally tripped that breaker. You get sequence of events records and also you get sinusoidal waveforms. So it is very easy for you to uh, get those uh, pictures and then know right away. And then advantage of knowing where the fault is and what is the cause of the fault, you can restore the system also. For example, if there was a fault here and this relay by mistake operated, that's it's called a misoperation. Then when you look at these records, within five minutes you know that oh, this the fault was here. This shouldn't have operated or there is a setting problem or there is an error. So what I do is I just restore the system with this relay out of service. You have a backup relay or a secondary relay. You put that till someone goes and then finds out what is wrong with that particular setting or if they know. So records, fault records or uh, event rec reports or sequence of events uh, records help you to restore the system as soon as possible. And they also they have the ability to communicate with the rest of the world. Uh, that means you have uh, an Ethernet connection or a cell phone connection now because these are in some areas where you don't have much uh, infrastructure. So they put mobile phones on that and then you have a calling ability. It, it calls back also to say that oh, I saw a fault. So you, somebody can uh, dial in and then get the uh, uh, thing out, get the, all the information out of that, out of that relay to find out what happened. <clears throat> so this is uh, called a generator protection. You have a feeder protection which is looking at it here. And then the bus protection is covering only this. So whenever you have a very defined uh, uh, zone, uh, you know, the, it's very, you know, here in this case, if there is a fault here, I know it is bound by four breakers and then I know exactly where the fault is. If it is outside, then I say this is not in this zone of protection. Then I don't trip these. And some other relay here, transformer relay, which is looking at it, trips this breaker, but it trips all other sources also on the high side. So knowing where the fault is, you can, uh, yeah, you know, you can know clearly what, uh, uh, you know, you have a very, uh, you have a very clear zone of protection in case of, sorry, you knowing the fault where it is, its response time also reduces. So now in this case, uh, there's, uh, which has a very definite, uh, uh, protection. These are called the differential schemes where in this case of a bus, the total current coming in must be equal to total current going out. It's just like a pipe with uh, three uh, branches. The total water coming in has to go out of these three. If there's a leak somewhere else, it's not equal to the same amount of water that is coming out. You can take that as an analogy. So we monitor whatever current coming in has to be equal to some of the current coming out. And then if it's not equal, then you have a differential operation, correct. So you have clear zones of protection. In this case, it is not clear, but it is just open-ended. Any overcurrent in this region, it knows where, uh, you know, it operates for that. Then you have a transformer that also sometimes is very clearly defined. This is called transformer differential, which operates for faults uh, and then opens this breaker and then opens the breakers that are connected on the high side, which I have not shown here. So it isolates only for faults within the transformer. <coughs> and then you have a line protection or a bus protection, which is connected to the high side of the transformer. It could be a transmission line coming in, or it could be another bus section like this with a lot of other transformers in parallel. You've got other configuration of the buses. So you have other protection like this. So the great uh, thing, what, uh, the thing which you have to look at it here is there are no blind zones for protection. For example, 
if there is a fault here, this relay also sees and then this relay also sees. Or if there is a fault in this particular breaker which is connecting transformer to the bus, the transformer differential relay also sees the fault and the bus differential also sees the fault. So you do not want to have an overload protection where uh, Show that they are the color. It's white, that's why it is not showing up. And let's see this. Right here. So, here, if I have a differential protection like this and the bus protection like this, yeah, if there is a fault here. The transformer protection thinks that it is not a transformer fault. The transformer protection thinks that uh, oh, the fault is outside my zone, it does not operate. It is just like uh, with blinders, it is looking at the transformer. Or if there is a bus protection, then it says that oh, it is outside my bus protection zone, then it does not operate, then nothing gets detected, the fault is not detected. So that is why when you do the uh, zones of protection, you have to make sure that the isolating device between two zones is common to both uh, protections. So when that opens, it either clears the fault on this side or fault on this side. So you will have overlapping zones in uh, protection scheme designs. So you, know, you isolate only the faulty equipment and zones are defined by the current uh, location CT and also the interrupting device. Uh, and then overlapping zones of protection is a requirement because you do not want to have some blind spots where both of them say, so oh, it is outside my zone, I do not want to operate. So these are three requirements for uh, protection schemes. <clears throat> yeah, we covered all of these. There are other ways, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, of detection also on this. It is called impedance relay, that is voltage. Uh, if you divide the voltage by current, then what it measures is the impedance. Uh, what is the impedance if you are using for a transmission line or a feeder protection? If the length of the cable is directly proportional, the impedance of the cable is directly proportional to the length. When you want to buy a transmission can a line over a transmission wire or a cable, they give you uh, it's uh, so many ohms per thousand feet for cable or it is about say 0.6 or 0.7 ohms per mile is the length of the line. So if you know where the fault is and if you take the ratio of voltage to current, it measures the impedance of, that line, of the line up to that fault point. So they are called uh, impedance relays or sometimes they are also called distance relays because impedance is directly proportional to the distance. That is used in the transmission system but in most of the wind generations these are all over current and then uh, uh, over voltage and under voltage relays and the impedance relays also are used in some of the wind uh, forms. Then directional uh, relay, it just sees how the direction of uh, current is. If there is a fault in front, here is a relay, I am looking at it and if there is a fault here, the current direction is always towards the fault short circuit. So if the current is going towards the short circuit from the point I am looking, then I say the fault is in front of me. If the fault is behind, if the current is going through me in the opposite direction, I say the fault is behind me. So this is not a fault on the line which I am supposed to protect. Then they use what is called directional release. It looks at the phase angle between the voltage and current to detect the magnet uh, direction. <coughs> then uh, we talked only about phase over current relays. Under normal conditions, so some of the A phase current and B phase current and C phase current, if you add all of them, it will be equal to 0 because they are 120 degrees apart and it is a balanced network. It is symmetrically balanced around 360 degrees uh, in a circle. So if you add them, then it adds, or adds to 0. So what you do is you put a neutral of the transformer or so you put a CT and connect a relay. Under normal conditions, the current is 0. Whenever there is a single line to ground fault or a fault involving ground, the current uh, appears there, then you detect it and then you 
get a sensitive overcurrent protection in the ground. The other one also they use is volts per hertz, uh, which is uh, a good indication of the amount of flux in a transformer is a, a very good example. Uh, because uh, for those of you who have studied uh, uh, you know, transformer principles, you know that the voltage E or uh, whatever voltage you are applying is equal to 4.44 times N phi B A F. Somewhere you have heard it long back, right? So what it is, is uh, you have a constant and the flux that is uh, uh, linking all the circuits and magnetic circuits is proportional to the ratio of the voltage to the frequency. So if the voltage is high and the frequency is low, the flux increases just like your overcurrent relay, the flux cannot be contained and then it heats the core of a transformer. So <coughs> you have to protect against it. So they use over, uh, volts per hertz relays. The other common one is <coughs> how fast the current is changing or how fast the voltage is changing or how fast the frequency is changing. They use rate of change of uh, relays to detect these abnormalities and take corrective actions appropriately. Sometimes, say, on a generator, if the, in, in, not in the case of wind, if it is a bigger generator, if it is speeding up very fast, then they know that it is a huge mass. It won't remain stable. It will go out of stability. Then they take corrective actions and then trip it out right away. That could be used for that. An unbalanced uh, relay is you are, you are supposed to have a three-phase balanced network then your voltages are within 5% and, and, and unbalanced also. Typically, they say it is within 1% of the nominal. So if it is a 19.9 volt kV of A phase to ground, B phase also will be 19.9 .9, and C phase also will be 19.9, plus minus 1% of that. And then ANSI, as, and for lower voltages, they define as the tolerance is 3% in 84.1 for lower voltages. But it is not true for high voltages. They are much more closer. Then a differential relay, I just went through that, where the current coming in has to be equal to some of the current going out. You can do that. Even if it is a winding on the generator also, you can put current uh, 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 transformers on both sides, phase side and the neutral side and total current coming in should be equal to total current going out, then you look at that and then uh, if there is any difference in current between the two, normally the difference current is zero. If there is a current, then you say that there is a fault and you detect that. Protection coordination, I told you that if there is a generator here and if there's a fault on the generator, you don't want this thing to trip, uh, bus protection to trip, or uh, any overcurrent here to trip, or transformer overload relay to trip for those. You lose the whole system. The farther the relay is from the point of uh, fault, if that operates, you have a much more wide area problem. So that is why it is important for you to isolate only those sections which are required. So if there is a fault here, you know that this breaker has to open. If that doesn't open, then you open this breaker, OK? So if in, in analysis also, it is very important that if only this breaker, op if uh, there is a fault here, if this relay operates, then you, <coughs> you know where the fault is. So typically, operators are there. System op you know, will have some operators who are going and then operating these devices, putting it in service and putting out. If there is a fault, they call you back as an engineer when you are analyzing and say that there was an A-phase to ground fault and this particular relay on the generator 15 operated. Then you know where the fault is. When they give that uh, situation and also they say this breaker also operated, that means either the breaker would have operated slowly or the DC connected to the tip coil so the breaker is out. So you have many other options. So that is where you have to go back and see uh, whether if the relay settings are correct then something else must have uh, operated. So as a protection engineer, a lot of times you get involved in telling the field what could be the problem so they can go back and fix it. And coordination, we covered some portion of it. Primary relay operates and opens the breaker. And then upstream devices will operate if the primary device fails to operate. Right? 
Typically, how much time delay I have to wait for? And you know that if there is a fault on the generator, and then a relay is typical operating time, if there is short circuit, is about three to five cycles, or two to three cycles. And at higher voltages, you have much faster relays. Two cycles is a breaker operating time. And then, uh, yeah, you know, it, the relay the operating time is that. That means the relay detects that there is an abnormality. After two cycles, it sends a command to the breaker to open the breaker to disconnect it. The breaker is also a mechanical device. It takes three to five cycles. So total clearing time will be about two cycles plus five cycles, seven cycles uh, will be your total clearing time. So the guy who is sitting at the substation sees a fault. He, says he has to wait for at least seven cycles before he makes a decision telling that something is wrong, I have to trip. So you have to wait for seven cycles, and then typically you give a safety margin of uh, another three to four cycles. So you wait for uh, you know, 11 cycles before you trip for a fault. So that is called a relay coordination time. So when a relay uh, engineer looks first, designs a system and puts all these relays, he looks at the operating times of the relays, and then he also uh, make sure that uh, you know, your relays, uh, which is uh, looking as a backup from somewhere else, it does not operate faster than this. Instead of uh, instantaneous overcurrent relay, suppose if they had used a definite time overcurrent relay, 15 cycles if the current goes above this value, they used only that. So under such conditions, then you have to wait for 15 cycles plus 5 cycles operating time of the breaker. 20 cycles plus a 3 to 4 cycles margin, 24, 25 cycles you have to wait. So the slower you clear a fault from the primary protection, you have to wait longer for all the backup protection to clear that. So you keep on uh, delaying the, the backup uh, protection. Where this is used, sometimes people don't use breakers. They use uh, fuses, just like you have MCBs in the house. And they have uh, fuses up to... Uh, uh, 230 kV also you can get fuses. So they use fuses here because they are much cheaper and the faults are, faults are not uh, very common. It's very rare, one per year or so. So why do you want to invest on the fuse? They don't use any of these uh, relays also. They put an overcurrent fuse uh, device. If the current ex exceeds that, it heats up. It's an I-square T curve. So it heats up and then melts the fuse uh, element and it opens that particular phase. Then some other relay looks at that and says, oh, there is an unbalance in the system, and then it trips the system in the backup. So they use that. So under such conditions, we have to wait for a certain time. Most of these are for generators uh, and uh, systems. Nowadays, you get microprocessor-based relays. The concept before microprocessor relays came were the electromechanical relays. They were from 1950s up to uh, even now. 60% of the utility relays are my electromechanical relays. They just like, uh, work like your energy meters. They have a disk or something which operates, and then they do that. Of late, uh, you know, because after 2003 blackout, uh, NERC, uh, uh, North American Electric Reliability Council, became a part of the federal regulatory agency. And they force and penalize if something does not operate correctly. And the penalties are in millions of dollars. So now there is a big rush in a lot of uh, utilities, which, was, you know, which had built most of the systems in 60s and 50s. They are upgrading these to microprocessor-based relays, which is going on. But still, majority of them are uh, electromechanical. But wind farms are pretty new. So they all have uh, microprocessor-based packages. So that means. Uh, in the electromechanical relay, if I wanted an over-voltage relay, I have to put one relay, one box. Then under voltage, I have to put another box. Then I have got an overcurrent relay, another box. Then I have got an impedance relay, another box. So there was a huge uh, steel panel which has got uh, multiple boxes, which was costing pretty high also. And also, these are, they were all single-phase uh, relays. That means if I want to monitor three phases, I have to get phase A overcurrent relay, phase B overcurrent relay, phase C overcurrent relay. And then you have, uh, you know, uh, over voltage and under voltage relays. So one panel was full of a lot of uh, boxes, and the cost was very high. But now with microprocessor-based relays, everything can be programmed. You buy a small unit, it could be used for an 800 megawatt machine, or it could be used for a small machine too. So all the functions are available for that. And we typically use mostly overcurrent, under volt, you know, 
and uh, voltage elements and frequency elements. So we will uh, just show some of the wind protection schemes. Where there are two manufacturers. Schweitzer Engineering is the one which makes all the microprocessor based relays in this country. And the other one is GE uh, uh, General Electric. They make wind farms also, wind uh, generators. And they have a factory in Ontario, uh, Markham. It was in Markham before, and they moved it to Ontario now. It's in Canada. They bought a company called Multilane, and they have those. And then uh, other manufacturers are there. They put package their own uh, devices sometimes. They have uh, microprocessor-based relays, which is a part of the control system. They put that as a package, and then they give it. Siemens is there, ABB, Alstom. I don't know who Vestas uses or Clipper. Most of the relays, and then uh, their devices are manufactured by these, and ABB or Siemens and Alstom in, uh, uh, in Europe. Let's look at some of those. I just wanted to show some cable data. Uh, if you look at the cable data, 35 kV shielded power cable, they call it. And then MV105 is the maximum temperature on that is 105. And then uh, they also give you, uh, for those who want to design, they say it's 100% or 133% insulation. What it means is this 34.5 kV system can have a grounded system. That means the neutral is grounded, or it may, may be an ungrounded system. If in the ungrounded system, what happens if one phase goes to ground? There is no other return, but there is no ground fault current. The voltage on the other two, normally 34.5 kV is 19.9. And then if there is an A phase to ground fault, then B phase and C phase goes to 34.5 kV voltage. The voltage goes up by 173% in the case of ungrounded systems. So for that, to prevent failures of these, they use what is called 133% insulation level. They have got much higher insulation, so the cables don't get uh, 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 you know, damaged. So they also give you electrical, I don't think you have electrical data here. They gave you ampacities also here for each individual cable. So 640 amps is this one. And then uh, yeah, this does not have uh, data of the electrical. Then I wanted to show another one. This is the latest uh, and the greatest, I think. I don't know whether you've heard. Did anybody say what is the biggest one you get? Siemens, 6 megawatts is, I think, uh, the biggest now. And then it has a span of uh, yeah, we'll go to technical specifications uh, right away. This is the blade. So that it's a pretty huge one. Yeah, it's 154 meters rotor blades or, or the size of that. And then uh, I was looking for electrical. Six megawatts, and then it's generating voltage of 690 volts. This is 50 hertz system in, uh, in Europe. Uh, they use permanent magnet generators. They have got uh, magnets on the rotor, and then they've got the windings, and then it generates at whatever speed that is coming in. Then they use uh, full uh, conversion from that uh, type 4 machine. I think uh, Professor Mohan might have covered it. Uh, they have the whole stator and rotor connected to the or electronics to bring the power out. Yeah, what uh, the tower mass is this, and then total weight was somewhere else also. It's a huge, uh, I don't know how they will build it. It's an interesting thing. They erect two machines uh, a day. Have I seen them? They just from nothing, they go back and then put two, and then uh, they can uh, install two of them per day. And, 
is not the presentation I want in this. This is uh, another machine unit. Uh, this is a generator protection relay from Schweitzer's. And then uh, it gives you the oscillography for anything. And also, most of these, they can be connected to a central station. So you can go to the substation and then look at all the uh, forms. It will be nice for you to go to southern Minnesota, uh, Chandler. There is, a, there is a control center for all the machines they, uh, uh, they control from here. And some of them are in Arizona also. So they send a signal from here. And it's a, it's a very highly sophisticated control center in Chandler, Minnesota. It doesn't have anything other than some wind and then uh, farming community. So these are, uh, this is how uh, they have represented here. I have got uh, phase and ground, and there's another thing called negative sequence, 50 instantaneous, 51, and the breaker failure. If the breaker doesn't, then, then it says that I, I, this breaker was given a trip command. It didn't open. So I can use it to send a signal to the remote end or other, open other breakers. Okay. So these are different types of uh, measurements that is available. The latest thing in the technology is called phasor measurement unit. Uh, it uh, synchronizes the voltage magnitudes with the clock, Eirik B clock. And then you know exactly uh, what is the voltage magnitude at here or in another uh, station, which is far away. And then you can get all the data at one place and then look at it, look what is happening. This is used in what is called wide area protection. This came after 2003 blackout. So if there is a disturbance in Canada, then we can detect here and then isolate ourselves so that they don't come and then pull us down. Similarly, they have those uh, in the West Coast also so that they can protect uh, the whole uh, system and isolate themselves. So if we had that in 2003, probably uh, we would have detected it and then isolated ourselves from that uh, total blackout. Yeah, that is the latest technology that is called wide area protection. So this is basically the crux of some simple methods. It gets very complicated protection, but uh, this is in short what we can do and then how, we, uh, how simple uh, protection schemes are used on wind farms. Any questions? Generator. In the case of a big generator, you have a steam generator if you take, okay? Steam is generated and then uh, rotates the turbine. Then you have uh, a, a generator, uh, you know, which is generating and then how it is done, they have got an exciter, rotor, which has got a DC input. So just like a permanent magnet, you put a DC there, then it rotates and then it generates a three-phase AC system to this. So now if you go back, and then what the power which comes out of this is directly proportional to the amount of steam which you put it in, put in the, uh, in this thing. So if you need more power, what you do is you give mechanical input to that. To maintain the voltage, what you do is you, may, you maintain the voltage with the electric field which is connected to the exciter, they call it. The field is connected to the exciter and then the machine, mechanical turbine is, connect, is driven by the steam. So your megawatt output, which is the useful output, which we use for uh, heating and all, is uh, 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 done by that. So now, if you go back and energize that without the turbine, what happens? There is a quick, uh, thing. If the steam acts as a coolant for these turbines to maintain the temperature at 1,000 degrees or 950 degrees, depending on the type of the generator. If you don't have that, and if you just energize it, the system will go and rotate this rotor at that speed. And then it churns the air, and then you damage all the generators. So what you call, you use a reverse power unit on that. You don't have it on this. And then uh, you have what is called uh, uh, loss of excitation. Suppose, as I told you, the excitation system which is connected to that gives you the ability to hold just like this uh, metrodome protection, the voltage and the air pressure to hold the dome up. So if it is heavily loaded system, then it comes down. So then uh, you give uh, the extra, extra excitation, so you give the re reactive power out of that to support the system. 
So if you lose that, then this generator starts consuming that extra load power, reactive power from the system, which might damage other things also, which will reduce the voltage in the whole area. So for that, you have got loss of excitation relay to detect those. Those are not there in this. So and then negative sequence um, uh, is another protection where any unbalance in the connected voltage system will produce a heating currents. Uh, unbalance produces a current which is rotating in the opposite direction. These are called negative sequence. And then if the motor is rotating in counterclockwise direction, this produces a flux in the opposite direction. So this is cutting the flux at 120 degrees, twice the frequency. So heating effects are very much on the side rings and the end rings. So bearings and all will get affected because of that. So you use an unbalanced protection on that because uh, cylindrical rotor steam machines are, are you know, enclosed and then they don't have much uh, energy for that, uh, to take care of that, the tolerance for that kind of a thing. So you put those. So those are the variations. Otherwise, you still have an over current relay, an over voltage relay. And then the other one is uh, steam generators are connected to uh, higher voltages. So they are correct, any impact, any voltage, any fault on the highest system impacts the gen generator is much closer to the electrical fault. In the 345, even though the fault is about 200 miles away, 100 miles away, electrically the impedance between that and the machine is very close, very much less than a 345 kV system where you have got 10 miles. That impedance looks to be much bigger. It has little impact. The farther the fault, it has no, no less the impact here. But in the case of that, you have to take care of uh, those situations. So when the fault occurs, because of the steam, it uh, speeds up much faster. Your inertia is much higher. Then you get what is called out step conditions. And then under such conditions, the poles the slip. The machine is the accelerates, and then it cannot come back to the original system. And if the fault is cleared faster, it uh, slows down. It slows down too much. Then it speeds up, speeds too much, slows down. It is called hunting. So you've got uh, unbalance in the system, the whole system, why, you know, just oscillates. Uh, that is called power swing conditions. And under, if it is too much, if the fault is not cleared in time, it accelerates so much that it goes out of phase. And that means the whole electrical mass just jumps once. It is called pole slipping. Literally, the whole thing moves like that. The huge floor shakes. And then second time it occurs, they try to take it out. In Europe, they allow one pole slip, and they say that it can survive. But in US, uh, they don't allow that at all. They take it out of service. So those are the mass involved, and the electrical uh, severities are much higher. So that is why. And this is, a, this is a nothing but a motor that is on. If your system is disconnected, everything is uh, dead. There, if the fault occurs on the generator, if the system is disconnected too, the generator feeds the fault and destroys itself. So that is a major problem. You can't do anything about it on those conditions. So that is why they are complex. But if you look at these boxes, uh, if you buy from uh, some of these people, it is the same box they give you whether it is a, a 800 megawatt machine or it is a 1.5 kilowatt because the cost is the same, it's just one box. So that is becoming more and more uh, common in the industry. Yeah, you, you, are, you have a mic. In the case of electromechanical, you have to put so many extra boxes. And then people were conscious that if it is a you know, low-cost system, then you put a much uh, less number of relays. And then if it's a higher-cost system, you put more. Uh, typically, the cost of protection is about 6 to 7% of the total cost of the system. The protection designs are 7%. So, uh, but now the whole system is uh, changing because you have uh, one box, which is, say, $3,000, and then you can put it in any machine you want, and $3,000 is nothing. The cost of installation is much higher. Connecting the wires, they will, uh, you will go up to $100,000 for that. So the cost of the relays have come down quite drastically. Then you spend on the infrastructure of communication from there to the other house to get information. Those uh, are other equipment. But typically, it's about 7%, including that. So yeah, if you ask the question if modern relays, you can use any latest which is used on 1,000 megawatt machine and put it on this and just use those functions. But this has created problems in the industry 
because if uh, a person who is new to this field comes in and then he is given a box which has got about 100 functions, he tries to set every function in that, whether it is required or not, that has created a lot of misoperations. Because in the older schemes, electromechanical, you just put only three or four boxes which had that. This is a 19 inch rank there. You know, you have to just enable or disable a function. So most of them feel that, oh, you have so many functions, let me enable a lot of them, and that creates problems. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I worked with Excel Energy for 25 years here before I joined HDR two years back. I took an early retirement package and moved and came back as a consultant. That's all I did. I am not retired. <laughs> so the end, uh, what I'm doing is I work on the 500 kV systems on wind farm machines and also on motors and generators. So I pretty much, what I do is I set these relays so that uh, if something, if you have a blackout, then it might be because of me. <laughs> so. <laughs> So that is how the relay engineers are known as. So if something trips, then either it is not coordinated. It, most of the times, it is not a relay failure. It is setting failure. And the reason for that is I grew up with some philosophy for 35 years. So I take some contingencies telling that oh, this is the only minimum fault duration condition or maximum fault duration. So only one line can be out of service <coughs> you can't have. These assumptions kill uh, the system. Because we always assume single contingency that there is only one fault and our one line is out. But most of these blackouts are multiple contingencies, They're not one. Five or six lines are out and then this generation and all those kind of things get you. So I, uh, I specify relays, I design them and I set them, field test sometimes, commission. I commission the breakers also, I go out and then do, and I do static work compensators, SVCs, I do that all the time. Then I come here and uh, talk about it with you or give classes here and I work in IEEE also quite a lot. I'm the secretary of the power system relaying committee. So I work on a lot of standards that is developed by the industry here and, and IEC. As a typical protection engineer will be sitting, uh, someone else will design the system. For example, if you are a wind farm, the wind farm developer and uh, other uh, guys, physical people who put all the bus work, they come back and then say that, oh, these are the relays which are used and all. You look at it and you make sure that there are no blind spots where the protection cannot detect a fault. And then you set them and then you coordinate all the relays back up to the transmission system. That is what uh, a typical protection engineer does. Relay is two cycles, breaker is five cycles, seven, okay? Then uh, you don't give seven cycles because sometimes the breaker is a mechanical device. So they might have some slower operating time. So what we do is uh, we give, uh, if it is five cycles, we give four, five cycles as a margin for that. So, for, you know, your seven plus four is 11 cycles. That is how I came up. Any other questions? It's, when is the exam? Two weeks or? Oh, that's fine. Well, good luck. And then if you have any questions, please uh, send an email and then I'll be very happy to answer. It will be nice for you to, to look uh, practically how these things look, you know, yeah, how huge it is and all. If you go to southern Minnesota, if somebody is putting it in service, if you, Martinson, we had some person in University of Minnesota, one of the students who was working here. And uh, they can show you that. And then if you go to Chandler, just uh, go to the control center. It is amazing that uh, the technology they have in Chandler, which you can't uh, imagine that it's, it's up to, it's very good. <laughs>